Hi, Gina Sapiro. I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I just wanted to take a minute to welcome you here to the first Discoveries lecture of this academic year. We started this series a couple of years ago. It's part of the effort we're making, especially to reach out and extend the BU education back to the community and back to the people who were once students here. Everybody's welcome, people who are currently students and currently faculty. Uh, but one of the kinds of things we're really thinking is that uh, it's important to know that once you're a Boston University student, you have a right to come back and learn anytime. And so what we try to do is bring to you some of our best faculty, talking about the really interesting research they're doing, talk to you about current events, talk to you about historical work, science. Uh, how many of you have been to one of the Discoveries uh, lectures before? I thought I recognized some people here. So we try to mix it up through the course of the year so that we touch on different subjects. Uh, everybody who comes from every college at BU is welcome, but this is sponsored by the College of Arts and Sciences. We are a liberal arts, liberal education college, which means over the course of the year, we want to make sure that you sample the humanities, the social sciences, the natural sciences in a broad way so uh, that you can continue to educate yourself in that way. Let me just say a couple of things about the lectures that are coming up later in the year. Uh, and you can get this on the web. There's also a really nice, fancy new little leaflet out there. But we have three more of these scheduled during the course of this academic year. On December 1st, uh, we have a lecture called Lessons to be Learned from Cells, from Molecular Basis to Disease. And uh, this will be a lecture by Karen Allen and Adrian Witte, who are both professors in the Department of Chemistry. They are both known as fabulous teachers. Karen Allen came to us from the med school, and Adrian Witte came to us from industry. And they're just, they're totally fascinating. I love listening to them. February 17th, we have a lecture, Political Humor Throughout the Ages. I think we could probably use that. Maybe we could use it the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. But nevertheless, Political Humor Throughout the Ages. And the lecturer then will be Jeff Henderson, who's a professor of Greek languages and literature in the Department of Classical Studies. And he's my predecessor as dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, CLA, to some of you. I know that. And then finally, on April 28th, we have another wonderful guy. I've, I've sat on panels with him and listened to him a number of times, and I'm glad I'll get another chance. Um, I really welcome you. It is fabulous to see you. This I always call my senior year. This is my fourth year at BU. And one of the very exciting things about my four years here thus far is getting to know the alumni and the friends of BU. Uh, certainly knowing my colleagues on the faculty and getting to know the students is absolutely crucial. And I'm delighted at how many I know. But I think I can't really know the university unless I meet and get to know the alumni, uh, talk with you, hear about the days before I came. Uh, that, that's just crucial to me. And so I thank all of you who show up and help me with my education about my institution. And I especially thank the many of you I know who have helped to support Boston University by way of your generosity in volunteering through alumni groups, by giving gifts of various levels. We just, we can't live only on tuition alone. We are very, very thankful. And I know a number of you here have been very generous. So I thank you very much. Uh, and I, of course, to extend an offer to the rest of you to join those who of us who have helped to bring the kind of quality faculty to BU and scholarships and, and great classrooms and so forth we try to offer our students. You didn't come to hear me. You came to hear Professor Shulman. Bruce Shulman, I'm delighted to introduce, is a professor of 20th century US history. He's chair of the Department of History, so I uh, make sure that he never has extra time on his hands. I'm very grateful that he's here to do this lecture. He earned his undergraduate degree from Yale and then did his PhD at Stanford. He arrived here at Boston University in 1997. Before then, he had been at UCLA, so we were very, very lucky to be able to steal him from the West Coast. 
Bruce's interests and in his work in history have reached into the community as in 1989 to 90, he was director of the History Project in California, a joint effort of the University of California and the Cal State Department of Education to improve history education in the public schools. It's one of the things we're very proud of, that our scholars and teachers really do their work, not just for our own students and for other scholars, but for the community, to make uh, something better of the community. Bruce has authored several books in American history, from Cotton Belt to Sun Belt, Federal Policy, Economic Development, and the Transformation of the South, 1938 to 1980. Lyndon B. Johnson and American Liberalism, 1995, and the 70s, The Great Shift in American Culture, Society, and Politics. And so having completed his understanding of the 1970s, he has moved back and forward at the same time. And I hope you're looking forward as much as I am to hearing his comments on the 75th anniversary of the New Deal. Um, and uh, reflections on that time and how we understand it now. So help me welcome Chris Shulman. Uh. Thank you, Gina, and thanks for that uh, extravagant introduction. I'm reminded, actually, of a story that Lyndon Johnson liked to tell when he received that similarly extravagant introduction. He said, I only wish my parents could have been here to hear it because my father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> and I want to also thank all of you for coming out tonight on this fine night to think about the New Deal 75 years after and to consider its enduring legacy for American life. Now this is truly an epic topic because outside of war, the Great Depression was the great calamity in American history. Indeed, I think as much as any event, the Civil War or World War II included, the Depression must go down as the great American catastrophe. It laid low the citizens of this favored land like nothing before or since, shrouding them in misery, driving them into homelessness and desperation, subjecting them to freezing cold, hunger, and loss, seemingly without end, without hope. It thoroughly transformed an entire generation of Americans, touching every aspect of their lives, from the way that they reused tea bags, never throwing anything away, to the way that they would bear up under the great challenges of the 20th century and the great cruelties of the 20th century. The Great Depression and the New Deal. For the presidency of FDR is no less an epic drama than the depression it was designed to combat. No period in this nation's history so thoroughly, so vitally, and so enduringly transformed American public life as the eight years between Roosevelt's first inauguration amid a crisis of almost unimaginable magnitude in March of 1933 and the United States' entry into World War II in December of 1941. Now, the New Deal would mark the most dramatic, far-reaching period of reform in American political history. It revamped the political party system. It built a new electoral coalition that would remain dominant for at least 40 years. It laid the foundation for modern American government, enlarging the presidency, modernizing the office, and making it the preeminent branch of the national government. And of course, it constructed a social safety net for Americans. But the New Deal's impact went far beyond politics. It truly rewrote the rule book of American life, restructuring not only the relationship between the American people and their government, but between parents and children, landlords and tenants, old and young, artists and audiences, homeowners and lenders, bankers and depositors, stores and customers, even between Americans and the very land of the United States. And it put in place processes and institutions, expectations and assumptions that continued to structure American life from the 1930s through at least the 1970s and in many ways, as we'll see, right up to the present. So to begin our journey then, I'd like to start 
with a short film clip and to ask you just to comment on what you see. So I'm going to hit the lights here. Oh, sorry about that. Observations. What did you notice in that film? What, if anything, stuck out to you? And there's nothing, nothing's too small or too insignificant. So what struck you? Any observations? Yeah. Two observations. One, the crowd was wealthy. Two, give a man a job. What was doing that worked outside the home at that time? Well, actually, no. I, I, in fact, uh, lots of women worked outside the home. And during the Depression, more women went into the paid labor force because of the unemployment of their husbands, fathers, sons, and so on. But certainly there was the prevailing, a prevail, one of the prevailing ideas of the New Deal was this idea of the family wage and that it wasn't, that it was a bad thing that women were in the workforce. And so that if you could create jobs at what they called the American wage or the American standard of living, that would mean that it wouldn't be necessary for women to work. But yes, you're right, it is. Give a man a job, that's a great, Great observation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The basic message would apply today. The basic message would apply today. It would apply today. Uh, and what's the base? But what's the basic message? Create jobs. Create jobs. Okay. All right. And so, I mean, one of the things it is saying is here it is, it is suggesting that private sector people should be creating jobs. It's a little bit ridiculous, right, that the, the woman who's identified as a hypochondriac isn't going to create jobs by finding a doctor for every one of her fake ailments. But yes, so that idea, right? So that's, I think that's something interesting. Yeah, good. Yeah, and, and, and I think even if you look at how, how that film ends, where the sign drops down and then it goes in on the portrait of the president. It's almost a little scary. It's almost a little scary. 
the imagery of the great of the great leader there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other observations? What do you make of the very existence of this film? I mean, here is a film put out by a government agency that is clearly pro Roosevelt. Yes. Fair enough. I mean, I think it's really interesting here. I mean, one of the things that we can ask is, are the, I mean, in some that, that last, that last bit of imagery does strike us as slightly fascist almost. But we have to ask the question of whether it really is being influenced by fascist aesthetics and values, or whether actually both are drawing on a new vocabulary, a new visual vocabulary that the growth of film and, and radio would be the, the, the auditory component. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I think that just that, that some of the imagery and the way that it focused in uh, without some of hang. Go ahead. So I was struck by, by the way it was done. That is, as entertainment and as an entertainment. I mean, I, usually they're very serious and dry kinds of, of uh, attempts to get things going. But this was really uh, captivating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here's one of the most popular entertainers in the country, and he's doing his he's doing his song and dance act for the National Recovery Administration. And what does that tell us about the way that the government is relating to the American people, right? And something pretty new at this time. Yeah, one maybe one more here, and then there, and then we'll get sure. go. Uh, the fact that there weren't any jobs meant that governments are stepping into the breach to uh, stimulate the economy and create jobs. Mm -hmm. And I can't let this discussion go on too long because you're going to take every point that I'm going to make, and I'm not going to seem nearly as smart if you guys say it everything first. Okay. Of modern public relations, certainly. All right. Good. All right. All right. So let me. I mean, I think you've identified what I think are the key issues I want to explore with you tonight. First is the relationship between government and mass media. What does it mean that MGM, the Hollywood film studio, is producing a film for the NRA and one that is blatantly so pro-Roosevelt? What does it tell us about the ways that Americans are relating to their political system in the 1930s and after? We'll explore that. Second, the relationship between government and American society in general. What do we make of the expectation that Americans could now turn to the federal government to the White House even, to a president who, as Durante put it, gives us what we ask for. That expectation itself is new and different and significant. Then third, I want to explore with you the relationship between different groups within American society. Because of the New Deal, the obligations between young and old would change, between labor and management, farm owners and their hired hands, all kinds of fundamental interactions would change. So let me begin, though, with some background, with a brief reminder of the crisis that ushered in the New Deal, some cold and stark measures of the calamity that overtook the United States. So during the Depression, the bank failure rate and the business failure rate reached an all-time high. Millions of Americans lost every dime they had, and those who had money found that there was little that they could buy with it. Between 1929, almost one out of every seven businesses in the United States failed, between 1929 and 1933. Farmers, who had already been suffering even before the Great Depression began, faced even more catastrophic conditions. The prices for the commodities they grew and, and raised crashed. In many cases, it no longer made sense to harvest your crops. 
cotton and corn lay withering in the fields. Milk spoiled on the side of the roads because there was, it wasn't worth it to sell it, uh, to transport it to market. Farmers killed their livestock rather than buy feed for them. Workers, too, faced unbearably desperate straits. Unemployment rose from 1.5 million in 1929 to 13 million by 1933. More than a quarter of the workforce, one American in four, lost their jobs. And those who kept jobs, who clung to employment, saw their paychecks shrink. Wages dropped by more than 50%. Income plummeted. At one point, 28% of the US population had an income of zero. The total output of the economy, the GNP, plunged from 104 billion in 1929 to 41 billion in 1933. So think about that. More than half of the value of all the goods and services produced in the entire United States disappeared. And these national figures only understated the level of desperation in some parts of the country. In Detroit, half of the labor force was unemployed. In Chicago, 40%. In Colorado, 90% of the state's workers were getting less than three days of work a week. Half of them had no work at all. Evictions and foreclosures became commonplace. There were more than 200,000 in New York City alone in the year 1931. So commonplace that there was actually a popular vaudeville routine that joked about all of these dispossessed people on the streets. Who was that lady I saw you with at the sidewalk cafe? That was no lady. That was my wife. That was no sidewalk cafe. That was our furniture. Many Americans simply took to the roads or rails. No one knows for sure how many sneaked into railroad yards at night and crept into empty boxcars. Certainly the numbers reached into the hundreds of thousands, maybe even higher. Meanwhile, frantic depositors jostled and shoved up to teller's windows of the nation's banks, demanding their cash. In state after state, the banking system buckled. So it's hard to say how many banks failed, because some were bought out, some merged with others. But more than a third of the banks that existed in 1929 did not exist five years later. Something like 30,000 banks in 1929, something like 18,500 banks in 1934. Those banks disappeared, never to come back. By the morning of Inauguration Day, 1933, the day that FDR would enter the White House, the New York Stock Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade had suspended trading. The governors of 32 states had shut their banks to prevent total collapse. In the remaining states, depositors were limited to withdrawing a maximum of 5% of their money. The suicide rate climbed to an all-time high, and many survivors, observers noted, seemed little better than walking dead. Millions of Americans, respectable middle-class Americans, dressed for business each morning, left their homes with marked up newspapers tucked under their arms, marched off to employment agencies, and waited doggedly in lines for jobs that did not exist. This man, the writer Sherwood Anderson, saw in his words, men who are heads of families creeping through the streets of American cities eating from garbage cans, men turned out of houses and sleeping week after week on park benches. Our streets are filled with beggars, Anderson said, with men new to the art of begging. Well, the task of leading the nation out of depression fell initially to Herbert Clark Hoover, the 31st president of the United States. Now, Hoover had earned his reputation and his first $4 million as a mining engineer after graduating from Stanford University in 1895. During the First World War, he had become an international hero. He directed relief efforts for the people of Belgium. And after the United States entered the war, President Wilson chose him to run the US Food Administration. During the 1920s, he served, in one person's words, as Secretary of Commerce and Assistant Secretary of Everything Else, 
a position he continued to hold until winning the Republican nomination for president in 1928. So there was no person who was associated with the boom years of the 1920s more than Herbert Hoover. And I think much more than his bosses, Presidents Harding and Coolidge, Hoover had been the architect of and the spokesman for the Republican new era of business government cooperation and prosperity. And in fact, during the 1928 campaign for president, Hoover had declared, I quote him, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. He meant it, the nation believed it, and yet despite his formidable qualifications, Hoover was not up to the disaster that befell him. He truly was the right man at the wrong time. Now, he did not do nothing. President Hoover was never a do-nothing conservative. Old-style progressive reformer that he was, he tried many things. But Hoover would not offer direct aid to people in distress, not create jobs on the government payroll, not tell businesses how to operate or farmers what to produce, not stimulate the economy through expenditures on public works. That is not challenge the normal ways of doing business. On those matters, he remained inflexible. He was willing to reform, but reform was not enough. And because of that, Hoover would be reviled, as you see here. Thousands of Americans clustered wherever they could in shanty towns built of anything at hand, tin cans, boards with nails, packing crates, and they became known as Hoovervilles in a kind of mocking tribute to the president. The old newspapers that you might use as shelter against the cold, those were Hoover blankets. I cannot believe that a national government will stand by while its citizens freeze and starve without lifting a hand to help, the governor of Pennsylvania complained in January 1932, in words, I think, that expressed the frustration of his countrymen. I do not see how it can refuse to grant the relief which it is in honor, in duty, and in its own interest bound to supply. But Hoover was not listening. The administration's, this is his words, the administration's fundamental policy is not to be changed. Well, by that time, few Americans were sharing his faith in American institutions. Truly radical visions were flourishing around the country. Suffice to say now that almost everyone was convinced that American capitalism and even American democracy had failed. Many saw signs of an erupting revolution. Hunger marchers paraded through the cold streets of Chicago and New York, breaking windows and demanding food and shelter. Iowa farmers stopped milk trucks at roadblocks and poured the milk into ditches. Mobs halted foreclosures on homes and ran the bankers and insurance agents out of town. When a loan company in Nebraska tried to repossess two trucks, the residents organized themselves into what they called a Red Army and took the trucks back. Looking back on those years, the great American filmmaker Preston Sturgis imagine that even a young film director, a fabulously successful maker of musicals and light comedies, would be driven to radicalism. And to the horror of the studio moguls, who are making profits off his films, he wants to make a radical picture to expose the injustices and failures of the American system. He wants to make a film he's going to call Oh Brother, where art thou? Here's a clip from this film. This picture's an answer to communism. It shows we're awake and not ducking our heads in the sand like a bunch of ostriches. I want this picture to be a commentary on modern conditions, stark realism, the problems that confront the average man. But a little bit. A little bit. I don't want to stress it. I want this picture to be a document. I want to hold a mirror up to life. I want this to be a picture of dignity, a true canvas of the suffering of humanity. But with a little section. With a little section. How about a nice musical? How can you talk about musicals? 
suffering. You're a gentleman to admit it, Sonny. But then you are anyway. How about making ants in your plans for 1941? You can have Bob Hope, Mary Mark, maybe even Crook. Yeah, but dancers. Maybe Jack Benny Rush in a big name band. What? Oh, no. I want to make a brother where I'm now. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do first. Go down to the wardrobe and get some old clothes, some old shoes. Huh? And I'm going to start off with 10 cents in my pocket. What? I don't know where I'm going, but I'm not coming back till I know what trouble is. What? The studio wants to make a publicity stunt out of Sullivan's travels, but eventually he breaks free and experiences the dark world of Depression America. So it was in this setting then, in the setting of the Great Depression, that the nation waited anxiously for the arrival of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. As Roosevelt made his way to the Capitol on Inauguration Day, in the very lowest moment of the Depression, he passed a crowd of some half a million Americans who had gathered in Washington, D.C., some in trees, some on rooftops, all fighting for a glimpse of the president-to-be. Arriving at the Capitol, he was escorted to the podium by his son. Remember that this polio-stricken man could not walk without aid. And breaking with precedent, he recited the entire oath of office rather than merely repeating, I do, to the Chief Justice's interrogation. He then proceeded to give one of the great orations, one of the great speeches in American history. He began by confessing the gravity of the situation, only a foolish optimist, he said, could deny the dark realities of the moment. But then he went on to reassure the nation with these famous words. This is a day of national constitution. And I am certain that on this day my fellow Americans expect that on my induction into the presidency, I will address them with a candor and a decision which the present situation of our people entails. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, boldly, frankly, and boldly. 
he did not, however, stop with words of reassurance. He went on to explain the moral and political failures that had brought the nation so low. Primarily, he explained, primarily this is because the rulers of the exchanges of mankind's goods have failed through their own stubbornness and their own incompetence, have admitted their failure, and have abdicated. True, they have tried, but their efforts have been cast in the pattern of an outworn tradition. They know only the rules of a generation of self-seekers. They have no vision, and when there is no vision, the people perish. Well, FDR and his brain trust got to work right away. During the campaign, he had promised a new deal for the American people, and he set out to deliver. Within months, he developed programs to save the banks and regulate the securities industries, stabilize agriculture, recognize the role of labor unions and improve conditions for workers, provide direct relief to the needy and jobs to the unemployed, and not incidentally, he immediately legalized beer and moved toward the repeal of prohibition. So at the same time that the New Deal was producing so much dramatic policy action, FDR thoroughly revolutionized the relationship between the president and the people. In fact, in the midst of his first week in office, as the administration was moving to save the banks, FDR spoke to the nation over a national radio hookup, the first of his many informal fireside chats. scene reflected, no president had ever gone to so much trouble to explain to the public in simple language just what was happening and what he and his people were doing. He appeared to take all citizens into his confidence as equal partners in the great task, a tactic he would use 30 more times during his presidency. Well, the reaction to that chat and his actions was immediate and overwhelming. 450,000 Americans wrote their new president during his first week in office. Thereafter, mail poured in at a rate of roughly 6,000 letters per day. So before FDR became president, there was one person, a single person staffed the White House mailroom. Now they had to hire 70 people just to handle the correspondence. So Roosevelt touched the hearts, the imaginations of his fellow Americans like no president before him. And that was not an accident. Roosevelt consciously deployed the new medium of radio through which he could speak directly to the public. And the main reason for that was that Roosevelt believed, correctly I think, that most of the newspapers in the country were controlled by interests who were opposed to his policies and ideas. But if publishers and editors opposed him, he could communicate through radio. He could also cultivate newspaper reporters. FDR held two press conferences every single week, not the one every six or nine months that Herbert Hoover allowed, or the two or three a year that has become commonplace in our own time. Twice a week, once in the morning and once in the afternoon, so that the morning and evening papers could trade the scoops. Reporters, not surprisingly, loved him. They never printed the off-the-record stuff that he favored them with, and they became willing conduits for his views. Roosevelt also built extensive connections to Hollywood during the New Deal period. 
closely and enthusiastically cooperating with the film and music industries. And that was no mere glitz, because in many ways, I want to submit to you, one of the central problems of modern American political history is the shift from a politics of parties to a politics of interests, from the era of the machine to the era of the consultant and the ad campaign. Gradually, over the course of a century, forms of mass media and even mass entertainment would replace political parties as the principal mediators between politicians and voters, the principal vehicles for political mobilization in the United States. So here you see some of the birthday balls that Hollywood uh, celebrities participated in. These are FDR's birthday being celebrated and some of the stars of the day participating. I think we can see the early stages of this process in the Roosevelt years, one that will lead from FDR's star-laden birthday balls to JFK appearing on stage with the Rat Pack, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and others, to candidate Richard Nixon on Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In in 1968, Hollywood actors like Ronald Reagan and Arnold Schwarzenegger translating their celebrity into high office, Bill Clinton playing the sax on the Arsenio Hall show, Sarah Palin and Hillary Clinton appearing with their comic doubles on Saturday Night Live, and even a sitting president, President Obama, visiting with Jay Leno on The Tonight Show. But of course, the Roosevelt presidency initiated much more concrete revolutions in the forms and extent of American governance. The Roosevelt's New Deal changed institutions and policies, restructuring fundamental aspects of American life. It also changed the relationships between people and their governments. So what do I mean by that? Well, obviously, the New Deal accomplished many different things. It created a veritable alphabet soup of new federal agencies, known by their initials, FDIC, HOLC, SSA, CCC, WPA, AAA, TVA, REA, and that's just to cite a few. Let's consider just a couple of these. The REA, the Rural Electrification Administration, brought electricity to previously dark reaches of rural America, places so remote that private companies would not bother to provide service. The New Deal also insured mortgages for millions of homeowners, allowing them to hold on to farms, businesses, and homes. And of course, it offered low interest lo loans that allowed millions more to purchase their very first homes. It stabilized American agriculture ending decades of suffering on American farms, but at the same time prompting millions of farm people, especially African-American sharecroppers from the South, to leave the land. The great work relief agencies built huge dams, new parks and post offices. They commissioned photographs, murals, plays, and poems. It was federal work crews that built the Triborough Bridge in New York City, the Lincoln Tunnel, LaGuardia Airport, Skyline Drive in Virginia, the San Francisco Bay Bridge in California, the Bourne Bridge and Sagamore Bridge uh, linking Cape Cod to the rest of Massachusetts. The New Deal ensured bank deposits and regulated the securities industry. It recognized labor unions, provided pensions for the elderly, and jobs for the unemployed. Indeed, the federal government would become far and away the nation's largest employer during the New Deal era. Now, if you'll permit me a brief digression to kind of step out of my talk for a minute into a contemporary controversy, or maybe a not so contemporary controversy, because despite all of these accomplishments, there has been and there remains today a certain residue of skepticism about whether the New Deal really accomplished anything and what it accomplished. What's funny is that that interpretation of the New Deal that was favored by scholars and experts on the left in the 1960s recently resurfaced uh, from experts on the political right. Uh, I think preeminently uh, the former Wall Street Journal editorial page editor Amity Schles in a book called The, For the Forgotten American. <laughs> 
And so I just thought that I would try to put some of the data in front of you and let you come to your own decisions about what it means to say that the New Deal didn't accomplish much or that it didn't even end the Depression. So I have here a chart which shows you the solid line is GDP. That's the economic growth indicator. The dotted line is unemployment. And you can see that in 1929, unemployment is very low. GDP is fairly high. And what happens? Unemployment soars, reaches its height in 1933 when FDR becomes president. And then it goes down. And then 1937, 1938, there's that little bump. Well, guess what happened? In 1937, Roosevelt ex said, you know what? We have recovery. Now I'm going to stop doing these things I was doing and try to balance the budget. And then we get the so-called recession of 1937, 1938. They correct that bad idea, and unemployment continues to go down. Similarly, I think if you see economic growth, it, the Hoover period is going down. Then it steadily goes up. It takes a while, however, to get back to where we started. And I think that raises a couple of interesting questions about how are we going to measure these achievements? What do we mean to say that the Depression was not ended by the New Deal? So consider the economic growth, the, the GDP. One of the things that we can see here is that, yes, it's true that it's not until the World War II that the economy gets back onto the trend line where it would have been if there was no depression. But from the time that Roosevelt takes office, the decline in growth stops, and we get pretty steep growth. So yes, unless you were, unless you were going to say that you expected him to be able to cure the depression, get back to where you were in 1929 overnight, then I think it's pretty clear, actually, that economic growth is restored. Let's take another a look at one more thing, and that's unemployment. And this is where Amity Schles makes her case. She has a very interesting uh, way of measuring unemployment. And her argument is that unemployment doesn't go down very much. Unemployment stays high all the way up till 1940. But I have two different charts here. The blue measures unemployment of the total labor force, that is not including the military, the total civilian labor force, public and private employees. The red measures only the private labor force. Mm -hmm. So those people that, what? Green. green. Uh, I'm colorblind, OK? So I, and I have red, green, colorblind. So I, I just assumed it was a red. So, I, so I, that's embarrassing. But, mm -hmm. It's a different color. Let's look at it. The green. Mm -hmm. What Schley says, and the reason that she can say, look, in 1938, unemployment is still all close to 20 percent, um, is because she doesn't count people that were working for the government as employed. Now, because those aren't real jobs. Now, you know, that's an ideological decision you make, but it seems to me that if I'm working 40 or 44 hours a week building the Bourne Bridge, getting paid for it, I feel like I'm employed. <laughs> uh, and so, and I, I expect that most Americans shared that idea because, of course, they kept re-electing Roosevelt at record, at record margins. So I think I just wanted to, to kind of interrupt and just put this contemporary debate in front of you and give you some idea of what the evidence is based on. It's true that unemployment remains at higher levels than at 1929 until World War II, but it's also true that the New Deal era substantially reduces, cuts by more than half unemployment. And so, again, unless you think that nobody should have been unemployed as a measure of success, then I think you can see a fair degree of success. That's a very good point. Let's come back to and let's come back to that. Because one of the things that I also want to stress is that the New Deal just didn't have the effect, it didn't have economic effect, it had other effects. And one of the effects was that it revamped the party system. So in 1936, 
he won a stunning victory, a margin of 28 million votes, up to that point the greatest landslide in American presidential politics. Six million new voters cast ballots for the first time in 1936, most of them people among the have-nots, most of them for Roosevelt. Despite his utter lack of attention to issues of civil rights, African Americans, thankful for the federal jobs they received, and the intercession of the federal government between them and some of the small town big men of the South. For that, and for a few symbolic acts, like a prayer at the Democratic National Convention led by an African American chaplain, African Americans bade farewell to the party of Lincoln and joined the Democratic coalition. The New Deal coalition, the liberal alliance that would dominate American politics until at least the 1970s, a coalition of middle-class liberals, working-class ethnics, Catholics, Jews, labor, blacks, and the poor came together in support of Roosevelt. But more than anything else, the New Deal changed the relationship between the federal government and its citizens. And I want to explore that in some detail. Because as late as the 1920s, Washington remained a remote place. The president, a remote person. Federal agency is something that you read about in the newspapers if you thought about them at all. In fact, the post office was pretty much the only arm of the federal government that ordinary Americans would see in their daily lives or feel in their day-to-day -day existence. And the New Deal changed all that. So let me explain. Before the 1930s, working people looked mainly to their families, their employers, and most important, their religious and ethnic networks to get them through difficult times. If you were in need of a job, food, money for rent or clothing or hospital bills, needy people called on their extended families, their churches, or on ethnic organizations. The Slovenian Relief Organization, the Polish National Alliance Benevolent Association, the United Jewish Charities, the United Catholic Charities. But the Depression simply overwhelmed these networks. They could not keep up with the demands, the desperate demands for help, often from people who had once been the donors to these charities. Now they, want, now they need to be the recipients of aid. Well, some employers also felt the responsibility to assist their workers. In 1930, for instance, U.S. Steel proudly declared that none of its men would be forced to call upon the public till for help. Before long, however, most companies were forced to cut back aid. By 1933, more than half of U.S. Steel's workers were unemployed, and there was not a single full-time worker on its payroll. So picking up that burden, taking up that responsibility, the federal government of the New Deal era experimented boldly, repeatedly, not always successfully. I just want to point here to two pieces of legislation, two landmark, uh, two landmark measures of 1935, whose 75th anniversary is we marked this year, measures which established lasting features of American public life, features which, for better or worse, continue to define national debate in the 21st century. The first of these 1935 laws was the National Labor Relations Act, best known as the Wagner Act after its sponsor, Senator Robert Wagner of New York. Often called the Magna Carta for American Labor, it set up yet another new agency, the National Labor Relations Board, to act as the umpire in disputes between labor and management. Most important, it insisted that the workers on any shop floor should decide in a free and fair election whether they wanted a union and which union they wanted to represent them. And if a majority voted for a union, management was compelled. They had to negotiate with them in good faith or face penalties. So New Deal labor policy would spark a wholesale reorganization of American industry. You see here, in the wake of the Wagner Act, here's a handbill sent out to Ford workers by the United Auto Workers, and it says uh, right near, it says, I think right near the top, the Wagner Bill is behind you, right? Now you have the Wagner Bill behind you. You don't have to have some of the same fears that you had before. 
So it would fundamentally change relations between management and labor. And it certainly gave a boost to organized labor. Union membership more than doubled during the decade of the 1930s. But think a little bit about what it was exactly the Wagner Act did. This was not a recipe for socialism, not government as owner and operator of business, as would be the case in many other countries during the Great Depression. Nor merely was it government as regulator, simply laying down the rules of behavior for business. Instead, the Wagner Act established the government as a kind of broker, a referee, guaranteeing that various competing interests, labor and management, could compete on something like a level playing field. So the Wagner Act then signaled the rise of what some have called the broker state. And it helped to shift the arena of much social and economic conflict. Owners and workers no longer fought only on the shop floor, but also in the corridors of government, fighting to influence policy. This would be true not only with regard to relations between labor and capital, but also with consumer organizations, civil rights groups, women's groups, bankers, car makers, universities even. So we can see in the New Deal broker state the birth of something like modern interest group competition and the first PAC, the first political action committee, emerged in 1937. The second landmark 1935 measure was Social Security. Roosevelt imagined, when they began to develop the plan for Social Security, he imagined a very extensive system of social insurance, a truly national safety net for all citizens. He saw no reason, he told Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins, one of the architects of the plan, why everybody in the United States should not be covered or why it should not last from cradle to grave. What actually emerged, of course, was much more modest. The Social Security Act of 1935 provided for unemployment insurance and old age pensions. It also established aid for the blind, the disabled, and for dependent children. With these, what Perkins called practical, flat-footed first steps, the groundwork for the modern American welfare state was laid. Social Security remains, as we all know, the backbone of American social policy. As our own Massachusetts Congressman Tip O'Neill famously put it, Social Security is the third rail of American politics. Touch it and you die. And think about the impact, because in 1935, something less than 5% of Americans had pension plans of any kind. And of people over 60 who would need to draw on them, even fewer. We pay now for the dreadful consequence of economic insecurity and dearly, FDR warned. No one can guarantee this country against the dangers of future depressions, but we can reduce those dangers. And that security would come from new sources, from FDR, from Mrs. Roosevelt, from the alphabet agencies that were going to slowly, subtly replace the old institutions of family workplace, ethnic organization. Because you see, in 1932, most people voted against Herbert Hoover. By 1936, they voted for Roosevelt because in their words, he gave me a job or he saved my home. In fact, one unhappy husband complained that his wife was now, I quote, wearing the pants in the family rejecting his advances in the bedroom because, she says, FDR is now the head of the household since he gives me the money, not you. <laughs> and the files of New Deal agency are filled with letters, many of them on little scraps of paper. They actually have, a, at the FDR library, this is a terrible photograph, I'm sorry, I took it with my phone, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, an exhibition of, um, of, uh, of samples of some of these letters. Um, and little notes like this one from a North Carolina farmer. There ain't no other nation in the world that would have sense enough to have WPA and all them other A's. I do think, Mr. Roosevelt, that you are the biggest hearted man that we have ever had in the White House. It's the first time in my recollection a president ever got up and said, I aim to do something for the working man. Well, in Chicago in 1935, 
One Mrs. Olga Furk wrote a very different sort of letter to the president. She complained that her relief station mistreated her, that she was only $19 behind on her government mortgage payments, not three months behind, as that agency claimed she was, and that her son's Civilian Conservation Corps checks always arrived, la arrived late. How long is this rotten condition going to last? I am at the end of the rope. The rich get richer, and the poor can go to H H H dash dash dash. That's what it looks like to me. Let's have some results. Now, I think that Mrs. Firk's letter is truly historic. Not because she had complaints for the president, but as her historian has put it, because only a few years later, her expectation that the federal government should provide her with relief, a mortgage, a job for her son, and be fair and efficient about all of that would have been unthinkable. In the Depression, families like the Firks were now looking to FDR and the national government as they had once looked to other places. And that would not change for decades. Well, having lost faith in those old institutions, working Americans found new solutions, an expanded role for government, better organized and more effective labor unions, which they hoped would provide the security they formerly found in other places. And I think one of the ways that the current recession, steep and dramatic as it is, differs from the Great Depression has to do with all of those measures that the New Deal put in place to ensure there would not be a repeat of something like the Depression. So for instance, I think there are about 100, I don't know, I don't know the current figure, but I think there's been something like 150 bank failures as compared to 15,000 bank failures. Uh, no depositor lost their money. If you bet on the stock market or something risky, you might have lost your money, but if you had your money in an insured savings account, even if the bank failed, you didn't lose your money. The elderly, who were the most hard hit, poorest population in the United States during the Great Depression, right, are now the ones that are most protected. They have social security, they even have since the 1960s medical care. There's unemployment insurance for the unemployed. All of those things are part of the residue of the New Deal that make the experience of the current recession, steep as it is, very different. But there's also something else going on here that Mrs. Firk's letter points up. A sense of entitlement, that Americans had legitimate rights, that all citizens could expect certain goods from their government, lay at the heart of a new social vision embodied in the New Deal. It was exactly what FDR meant when in 1941 he sketched out what he called the four freedoms, the liberties that he proclaimed to be the basic rights, not just of Americans, but of all mankind. And most of us, I think, are familiar with the four freedoms from Norman Rockwell's famous uh, portraits of them done early in World War II. So among those four freedoms were some old standbys, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But he also included something new, freedom from want and freedom from fear. And those were not freedom from the restraints that a government might put on you, but freedoms from the conditions of the world that affirmative government was necessary to make in any way meaningful to protect. Well, what then can we conclude about the New Deal? Well, one thing is that New Deal economic policies, unlike those pursued by the dictators of Europe, never meant to destroy capitalism. It tried, if I can use a rather awkward term, to de-volatilize capitalism. That is, to make it less unpredictable, and at the same time to distribute its benefits more evenly. But as one of the era's most prominent historians has put it, humankind does not live by bread alone. Any assessment of what the New Deal did cannot rest with its economic policies and fail to acknowledge the remarkable array of social innovations nourished by Roosevelt's expansive temperament. Well, at the end of Preston Sturgis's Sullivan's Travels, I bet you were wondering how the story is going to end up, the character of Sullivan, played by the actor Joel McRae, disappears into the darkest recesses of Depression America. And thanks to a case of mistaken identity, 
He is assumed to be dead, and he ends up in a chain gang, in a brutal prison. And for the inmates, the only relief from a life of woe and brutality is, well, why don't you see for yourself? Well, Sullivan, of course, gets free. He returns to Hollywood, and now the studio wants to make his searing expose of the horrors of depression. But he doesn't want to do it anymore. He has learned that a silly comedy can do more to mean more than a serious drama. Sullivan, like so many Americans of the 1930s, set out to find oppression and rebellion they sought radical visions, they reformed, they created new institutions, but they found, they affirmed in the end, they ratified enduringly American dreams. The great achievement of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal, it seems to me, although some have viewed this same thing as one of its greatest failures, was just this feature, just this marriage of bold experimentation with familiar American idioms. We are going to make a country, FDR declared. We are going to make a country in which no one is left out. In that sentence, Roosevelt captured his presidency's lasting meaning. The New Deal, as one of my own teachers put it, gave to countless Americans who never had much of it a sense of security and with it a sense of having a stake in their country. At a time when despair and alienation were burying other peoples under dictatorships, that was no small accomplishment. No small accomplishment, indeed. Thank you very much. I should just say that Kirsten here uh, does a fabulous job in our alumni relations office, and I want to thank her for all the legwork she did putting this together. I also want to thank the students who were involved in putting this together. This one over here I know well. It's Katie, as, uh, was one of my former students. She is one of the stars of Boston University today. In fact, she just won a big fellowship, which is well-deserved. So anyway, yes, your questions. Yeah. 
Can you tell us, Rev, about ideas come from Mayor LaGuardia of New York City where some of the programs were working uh, in New York? Mayor well, certainly he got ideas from what Mayor LaGuardia was doing and also what, what his predecessor of governor of New York, Al Smith, tried, which is funny because Smith and Roosevelt had a, had a, had a, had a falling out soon thereafter. But yes, but also, I mean, one of the things that, what, that's interesting about Roosevelt and that he says over and over again is this idea of experiment. He was maddening to many of his aides because aides would argue some would present diametrically different programs. And he'd say, go ahead, go ahead. And they tried many things. In fact, they tried many things that we can see now are, were contradictory, that pushed in different directions. So he pursued what he called bold, persistent experimentation. And I think that idea was sort of fundamental to the Roosevelt presidency, which sometimes makes it hard to figure out what was the fundamental ideology or set of principles. Of the, of the New Deal, and that's why people have argued about it. For many years, people said that there are two New Deals, or three New Deals, a first New Deal, a second New Deal, sometimes even a third New Deal, because it seemed like he, jet, he would jettison advisors, get new ones, and pursue different sets of policies. But one of the things that was consistent was this interest in seeking out and trying new kinds of experiments. So yeah, go ahead, sir. I could, but you know what? That should be that could be a whole a whole a whole different presentation. So I mean, I think that Eleanor Roosevelt's role in so many different ways is central. In fact, for instance, one of the things I mentioned just in passing was that I mean, today we think a commitment to civil rights is fundamental to what we understand as American liberalism. FDR had no commitment to civil rights. Eleanor Roosevelt, on the other hand, did and advance the agenda of what would become civil rights in very, very significant ways. Um, also, um, you know, we could talk a lot about the relationship between Franklin and Eleanor that was complex and in the end, I think, tragic. Um, but, um, but also part of that, there was a personal relationship, but there was also a political relationship where both, un both had agendas of their own that they wanted to pursue, and both understood that they needed the other to pursue that agenda. And one of the things that from F, if we'll take it just from FDR's point of view, was that he could deploy Eleanor to say things and do things that he didn't think it was politically safe for him to do that could shift the spectrum, that could shift the range of possibilities. So yeah, that's, that's a great question, but we could talk about that all, all night long, but you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more, yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, that's Sam, okay, all right, good. Yeah. Well, of course, one of, I mean, that's a really interesting question, and it's hard to answer that question because that the, the growing international tensions that are by the end of the 1930s are what really dominate the sort of the revision of, of Wilson's reputation, and it's actually downward because as the war crisis is developing, an isolationist sentiment is developing. There are people that want to make sure that there isn't a repeat and that the United States doesn't get drawn into what they see as another European war. 
uh, there was this whole set of congressional hearings and of uh, national media attention to how the United States got into World War I and suggest that either that Wilson was duped by, manipulated by, or that he was in league with so-called merchants of death, that is, businesses that wanted to profit from the making of war material and ammunition. And that really, I mean, that very much damages Wilson's reputation at the end of it. Um, FDR himself has a very ambivalent relationship with the Wilson legacy, even though he served, as you all know, in the Wilson administration himself in the Navy Department. Um, his closest connection to the Wilson administration is through his mentor those days, a man named Josephus Daniels, who was the Secretary of the Navy, and who is the only, so far as I can tell, is the only person who, when FDR was president, st called him Frank. I don't think anybody ever called him Frank, but Josephus Daniels said, and when I was actually in the archives, I would see these letters that said, Dear Frank, from Josephus, it took me a while to figure out that he was actually writing to the president. You know, I, 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 didn't, I didn't see that. Well, that's a, that's a good question and maybe not a good, good answer, but it, it's hard to say because the international situation so much dominates how people are thinking about Wilson by the end of the 1930s. So we're going to uh, go across the hall for reception in just a minute, but I'm going to give you a last one to see whether, uh -uh. whether the dean can stump you at all. I see two pictures up there that look pretty similar. Yes. Is there anything else similar about those or any comment to make about the similarities and differences? About that is the 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 time cover that kind of remakes Obama as as Roosevelt riding in the car with the cigarette holder. I mean I'm, I'm sure I'm being stumped here because I'm seeing the obvious, which is that time is kind of sort of suggesting that what's happening today is a new New Deal and is sort of recalling the New Deal era. But um, but what what am I missing? So. I just mean during the, the time two of them facing time. Right. Yeah. Times, and, I mean, is there anything more that in times re reminiscence there other than that it's a bad time and you got a democratic president? Well, uh, so you mean is there anything into the idea that this really is a new new that this really is a new new deal? I mean, I think that's a really good question. I mean, obviously, I mean, in terms of scope, size, and extent, neither the crisis nor the response is near that. But I don't know, I, I might make the argument that there is something in that. Now, of course, legislation, getting legislation through Congress is only a part of the story. Implementation is a big part of the story. I and mean, Lyndon Johnson, who was one of the other subjects that I wrote about, was someone who spent his whole career in Congress, loved it, knew it, was better than anyone else at getting legislation through Congress. Once that was done, he didn't really care much about implementation, and thus, some of Johnson's most important measures truly reshaped American life, and others, not so much. The New Deal, the story of implementation, is, uh, is, 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 is also where we can see the lasting effects. So I think it's maybe too soon to tell, but it strikes me that in, in terms at least of legislation that what we've seen in the last year is as significant as anything since at least Reagan's first year in office and maybe even since Johnson's first year and a half in office. And I, you know, I have to think that some of the things that are the big ticket items that we talked about, financial reform, the health care bill, the stimulus, uh, but also some of the things that maybe didn't get as much news, such as the changes in, in, the, in the way that federal education money is being distributed. Already we're seeing changes in the way that uh, curriculum is taught, teachers are hired and retained, and so that may have a truly lasting impact, but maybe it's still a little bit too soon to tell. It's always hard to know what at exactly what level to pitch something like this. So, go ahead. You, uh, you never mentioned the attempt to assassinate President uh, Roosevelt. Well, yeah, pr at that time, President-elect Roosevelt. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, I, he was President-elect.